Thank you. Thank you all for coming out tonight. I hold in my hand a pair of chopsticks. They are, in fact, an instrument. They require some skill to use artfully and effortlessly. Feeding yourself with an instrument such as these, instead of merely shoving food into your mouth with your fingers, is certainly an expression of culture and civility. They were designed countless generations ago in a distant corner of our prehistory. Our ancestor, whatever their name was, the inventor, gets no credit. Yet, they fit so nicely between your fingers, easy to balance food on, because they're counterweighted by the taper of the stick. They're just a pair of sticks. A pair of sticks with an intrinsically human purpose. A guitar is an object that you would more likely think of as an instrument. It takes artisanship and hand skills to make a great guitar. Because only a human knows what feels good to another human. This is a Martin Model 224, circa 1845. The designer and builder <clears throat> was a man by the name of Christian Frederick Martin I. It was built about two decades before Abraham Lincoln became our president. The top is made of spruce. The back and sides are made of rosewood. The fingerboard is made of ebony. The bridge is made of ebony. It has an internally X-braced pattern. It was built entirely by hand. The design and sonic characteristics arrived at without the aid of a single computer algorithm. This is a Martin 00028EC. The top is made of spruce. The back and sides are made of rosewood. The fingerboard is made of ebony. The bridge is made of ebony. It has an internally X-braced pattern. It was built in 2014, almost entirely by hand. It's an Eric Clapton signature model that was patterned off of one of his favorite old Martins. <clears throat> this is a shot of the Martin factory in the early 20th century. You can see the man in the foreground as he is gluing the binding onto the edges of the body. Now the binding is this decorative plastic purfling that runs around the edge of the body. And all the body's wrapped up in that cording. That cording is wrapped around it to hold the binding in place until the glue sets up. This is very early 20th century. Here's a shot from the early 1970s. Here's 2015. Here's 2015. Get the picture? There's that cording again. No computer, robotic, CNC construction. Just skilled human hands doing the same job for nearly 100 years. The results of that work to be picked up by an artist the likes of Eric Clapton, to give us all those moments of heart-filled music, or by anybody that simply wants to express themselves with a guitar. Hands. I spoke with Dick Boak from Martin recently, and I asked him why Martin, as a company, chooses to manufacture its guitars in much the same way as it has for over 150 years. And this is what he had to say. <clears throat> he said, well, you can build a guitar by hand using all the traditional methods and tooling. You'll spend a lot of time and a lot of effort, and you'll end up with a great guitar. You can then take that same instrument, digitize every detail of it, feed all that data into a very sophisticated computer robotic system, take the same exact set of raw materials, let the robot build the guitar, and you'd have two identical guitars. But are they the same? My position is that they are not. Why, I asked him. And he replied, because something gets embedded 
when human beings apply care to what they're doing. And that something is intrinsic into the fabric of the instrument. It's a quality that can't be achieved any other way. Hands and pride of purpose. You know, I don't know how many of you out there are guitar players, but when you play a guitar, the strings dance so subtly under your fingers, your hands wrap so perfectly around a wooden stick, a neck carved and shaped by human hands to fit our anatomy. The strings vibrate in sounds and harmonies heard over millions of years on our planet. The song of birds, the roaring of predators, the pounding of a waterfall, the rasp of a lover's breath, the beating of a heart. There is a reason why certain frequencies stack up and sound good to our ears. It runs through all of life. It even has to do with the air density on this planet. When you play a guitar, you get lost in the sound and the feel of the wood vibrating against your body. The very cells within you join in the song. You don't just hear a great song, you enter a great song. A song played on a wooden box with vibrating wires, built, tuned, and played by human hands. Whoops, wrong way. There we go, okay. This object, sorry about that. This object is known as a welding table. It came from the Intense factory in Tecaluma, California. It's scarred and dented from years of tool work and welding sparks being showered down upon it. Intense Cycles was founded and is still owned by a guy named Jeff Steber. Now Jeff is an inherently creative, gifted, and skilled artisan. He's worked with his hands all of his life. He's also a designer and builder of custom guitars. Now Jeff designs his mountain bikes using the same organic method that you can design a guitar or any other instrument in. He calls the process feeding the rat. You get a creative idea in your head and it just gnaws away at you in there until you pick up a tool and make whatever it is in your head. Jeff can have a prototype mountain bike frame welded, built, and out on the trails for testing that same day. His design and creative skills have given us some of the most memorable and intense bikes in the history of mountain biking. If we as a society stop valuing and teaching hand skills, and we have, where will the next generation of Dick Bokes and Jeff Stebers come from? For every 100 people, that have hand skills, really good woodworking skills, how many of them will design and build a custom guitar? For every 100 people that have excellent hand welding skills, how many of them will have the creative spark of design of a Jeff Steber? It's a numbers game, and it's a numbers game that we're going to lose if we don't press that pause button and take stock of what it is we're giving up here. Now, I got bit by the guitar bug early in life, late childhood, adolescence, and obviously it's still with me. The mountain biking thing came a little bit later in life. <clears throat> I used to commute to work on a local bike path that ran through the Wissahickon Valley Park in Philadelphia on my bike. And, you know, these mountain bikers would just come blowing by me on these beautiful bikes, going off into the trails up on either side of me on the Wissahickon Valley. Really, really great bikes badass looking riders and you know I wanted to be those guys but there I was pedaling to work on my little Schwinn on the gravel bike path. <laughs> Finally at the age of 47 I bought an old Cannondale F700. I spent months and many dollars rebuilding it looking forward to the day when I was finally going to tackle those trails. Out on my second ride I flew over the handlebars watched the bike sail over me while I was upside down in the air and I had enough time to actually contemplate that this is gonna hurt. 
I hit the ground on my right shoulder with a crunch that promptly severed all the ligaments joining my clavicle to my scapula. I have a permanently separated right shoulder. During that same crash, I also badly sprained my ankle. But I didn't know I'd sprained my ankle until I looked down a couple days later and I said, well, damn, it's all black and blue and swollen up to the size of a softball. A sprained ankle. I couldn't feel that I had a sprained ankle because my shoulder hurt so bad. <laughs> and I couldn't wait to get back on that damn bike because I realized that there was depth to this, that having a decent bike didn't make you a decent rider. It was the blending of the machine, the instrument, and the rider. Learning to ride a mountain bike is like playing an instrument. You need to respond to the feedback of the trail. Every vibration feeds its way back into your muscles and nervous system, and you play the bike and the terrain. The learning curve is extraordinarily steep, like learning to play an instrument. And as you gain competency, you gain familiarity. With the familiarity, the instrument becomes an extension of yourself. A high-end mountain bike is, in fact, an instrument designed with the specific purpose of transporting a human through natural, minimally altered, or unaltered terrain. And it takes artisanship to design, build, and tune something that can do that. Hand design and building skills, coupled with an understanding of our bodies, the way we move and breathe, along with the passion and heart that drives us to ride in some of the most beautiful places that the world has gifted to us is what creates a great mountain bike. The frame is made of carbon. I am made of carbon. The dirt I ride on is made of carbon. The handlebars connecting me to the bike are made of carbon. I am human, breathing hard, heart pounding, exerting, soul soaring human on a human built, human-powered machine. These amazing instruments can take us anywhere from our local trails to gorgeous, deep wilderness rides. Do we really want to sacrifice our design and hand skills to AI machines that neither know, care, or understand what it means to be human? Companies like Intense are an example of high-tech artisanship. They are to higher tech manufacturing what Martin Guitars is to traditional craftsmanship. These companies care about employing people and paying them to do a job with pride and purpose. There is really no need to sacrifice artisanship and quality for the sake of cost or to the latest algorithm. Nothing in this life is free. The cost to our humanity in order to constantly better the bottom line of a very select few is far greater than the cost of not doing so. It's costly to the quality of life within our society. It's costly in the terms of the quality and usability of the products themselves. And it is very costly to the environment of a planet that has a finite amount of resources. A guitar and a mountain bike are a couple of our noblest inventions. <clears throat> it takes artisanship, intelligence, human intelligence, to design and build them. Because only a human, however long ago forgotten their name may be, knows what feels good to another human. Now, I'm not claiming that automation and AI, that they don't have a place in the global scheme of things. Of course they do. We use them every day. The genie is out of that bottle. I merely posit that when one removes artisanship, one installs mediocrity. Or, taken to its extreme, you can dehumanize the process in its entirety, adding to that all-pervasive disconnect that we've all felt in spite of how well connected we are. When artificial intelligence achieves 
true intelligence, self-actualization, it will indeed be AI, alien intelligence. And it will have alien needs, alien thoughts, alien desires, and it's really not gonna care about chopsticks, guitars, bicycles, food, or anything else within the realm of human experience. There are no parallels in our history for the precipice on which we're now standing. We can simultaneously celebrate that which is at our primordial base and that which is at the pinnacle of our creativity and our intellect through our artisanship in design. Or we can travel down a road of ever-increasing mediocrity and dehumanization into our own demise. Thank you.